Everybody, we, we don't have a lot of time, so, and we have much to cover. My name is Elisenda Struppuertas. I work at the ILO, and I welcome you, everybody, in my role as co-chair of the Technical Working Group on Rural Youth Employment of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. And we are very pleased to, to organize this webinar just a few days ahead of the COP28, precisely on this topic. Um, because COP28 marks a critical moment uh, in view of, of the many crises we are facing and there's much ground to, to still uh, make and we think that uh, youth and rural youth in particular uh, should have a voice and more engagement in processes and, and we want just to, to, to share knowledge and to, and to have some thoughts about that. A couple of housekeeping matters before we get started. We have a rich uh, list of speakers for today. First, um, to remind you that the webinar is being recorded for information uh, purposes. And then um, to help us in moderating the session, we encourage you to use the chat box. I understand there's a chat box active. And so you can put, post there your questions as we go along and there will be a moment in which we can have a few minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers, but we might also use the chat to add, directly answer to you. So we, we, we encourage you to actively use uh, the chat box as well. So we have here with us a fantastic group of experts that will share with us some effective policy interventions, uh, some thoughts on how to promote green jobs and advancing a just transition in agri-foods and rural areas. And with no more dues, uh, let me get started with our first speaker, who is my colleague Camila Roman. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, Camila works as policy specialist at the ILO, and she works precisely on green jobs and just transition to sustainability. And well, she's uh, actively engaged in global policy processes. So I hope she can share with us what are key policy priorities, and underlining the importance of the just transition and just to give a little bit a uh, rural perspective and a youth perspective into it. So, Camila, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Many thanks, uh, uh, Elisenda, and uh, a big thanks uh, to the Doran platform for uh, the invitation. Indeed, uh, uh, it's uh, very timely uh, to hold this uh, uh, webinar uh, just a couple of weeks uh, if, uh, um, away from COP. Uh, so delighted to to, to share some uh, some thinking, but also to to hear some uh, some reactions and uh, uh, some ideas from uh, from the participants. Um, so I'll start by actually taking things uh, uh, a bit with a bird eye view. Uh, I know the focus of the session is uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, green jobs. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, for youth in rural areas, um, but I'd like to start by reflecting uh, um, at, in some ways about the nexus between uh, the world of work and the natural environment, because that's that's really important to situate uh, green jobs and uh, what it means uh, for uh, for youth in rural areas. And so we've got uh, uh, two. Um, aspects of the interrelationships uh, between the natural world and the world of work. On the one hand, uh, environmental challenges, including climate change, have far-reaching implications for the world of work. Uh, they're impacting uh, uh, economic uh, growth, they're impacting productivities, uh, they're impacting incomes and livelihood as a whole. And they have different impacts for different groups of people. Um, an example of that is the fact that uh, uh, we know that we, by 2030, 2% of working hours will be too hot to work. Uh, this means uh, uh, very high losses in terms of productivity, but it also means uh, new challenges in terms of occupational health and safety. So the need to act on climate and environmental change uh, is not just from an environmental perspective, but it's also from a labor, from an employment perspective. Um, but then climate and environmental action itself will have implications on the world of work. Uh, it will affect uh, the structure of the of economies, it will change uh, the structure of labor markets, and again, it will have uh, different implications uh, for different uh, groups and the different locations. So, if we have a, a closer look at uh, what the climate and green transition 
will mean for labor markets, uh, we have uh, four types of uh, dynamics. We've got some jobs that will be substituted, so some jobs within uh, the same sector that uh, will uh, uh, change. So you might have a, a shift uh, to, uh, from uh, uh, land, the jobs linked to landfill to jobs linked to recycling in the waste sector, for instance. Uh, most jobs will be uh, redefined. They will, they will involve uh, changes in the way we work, in the processes we use, in the technologies that we use. Um, we will have uh, jobs, uh, new jobs that uh, will be created, and, uh, and there will be an important section of that that uh, will be green jobs. Um, and there will also be some uh, jobs that will be displaced. We will have some jobs that will be uh, lost, especially in uh, fossil fuel related sectors. So the, the, the green transitions really poses uh, some very um, large opportunities, uh, especially when it comes to job creation, but also social inclusion. If we think about access to clean energy for marginalized communities, for instance, uh, but it also poses challenges, uh, uh, job losses being one, but also uh, temporal and spatial disconnects. So this means that the jobs that will be created will not uh, be created necessarily uh, in the same places or at the same time uh, when where jobs will be lost. And uh, um, social equity is not a given. So the fact that uh, the benefits and the costs will be um, shared and, and, uh, and balanced in, in their outcomes is not to be taken for granted. And there could be some uh, uh, increases of inequality if uh, adequate protections and adequate policies are not uh, uh, put uh, in place. So if we have a closer look at what this means in the context of rural economies and uh, for uh, youth in rural areas. Um, a first uh, a point to raise, and I, I think uh, I don't need to say this to this audience, but is that uh, uh, rural areas are very diverse. They are very diverse, both in terms of climatic conditions and in terms of environmental uh, challenges they face. Um, and they're also very diverse in the structures of their economies. The sect, of course, agriculture is the, is the bulk of employer in, in most rural areas, but uh, to what extent um, the, there are other economic activities, what they are, how uh, sensitive they are to climate change, how sensitive they are uh, to climate policies, will also um, change and modify and affect how climate change and the climate transition will affect uh, rural areas and the labor market uh, uh, there. Um, also, what this means for jobs uh, is important to, to, to think and what it means for youth. Uh, youth, uh, again, I think I'm, I'm speaking to uh, the converted, but uh, youth are not a uniform group. So the impacts that uh, uh, with, will be foreseen in terms of climate change or climate action for um, a woman, a young woman from an indigenous group is quite different from uh, the impacts that uh, could be foreseen from a male, uh, from a, 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 a young uh, male worker that uh, is in a, uh, in a, from a different kind of uh, background. So, um, and, and again, we can also add uh, the layers of uh, incomes, of course, that are very important. So dependent on, on the, whether we are talking about working poor or whether we are talking about uh, uh, not working poor, that will also impact to the extent to which rural youth will be impacted by climate change and, and, and how much they will be able to cope with climate impacts. Uh, and they will also uh, affect to what extent they will be able to um, take advantage of the opportunities presented by the green economy in terms of green jobs, for instance. We can think about skills. There are important gender disparities in terms of uh, uh, skills access, and this uh, can mean if, there's not the, if there are no deliberate policies for this, that young girls will not be in the same position as young boys to take advantage of some of these emerging opportunities uh, when it comes uh, to green jobs, especially that some of the uh, jobs of the future will be linked to uh, technology use and might be associated with uh, the requirements in terms of uh, STEM uh, skills, uh, for instance. So these are some reflections to say how this, uh, to, to talk about the complexity really is of the impacts of uh, the, uh, the transition to a green economy and the impacts of climate change uh, when it comes to rural youth and their employment uh, 
uh, prospect. So with all that complexity in mind, how are we going to manage this change? Um, and that's where the notion of uh, just transition uh, comes in. So just transition in a nutshell is uh, about uh, uh, supporting ambitious uh, climate uh, action and, uh, uh, and action on other environmental challenges on the one hand, and on the other hand, delivering uh, uh, social justice and, uh, and decent work. Um, it's about maximizing uh, the positive impacts, the opportunities of the transition when it comes to uh, economic and employment gain, while minimizing and carefully managing uh, those uh, uh, negative impacts. And uh, how to, this is to be done is through a process of social dialogue with workers and employers' organizations and stakeholder engagement. At the heart of just transition is a respect for uh, fundamental principle and rights at work and, uh, and, and human rights. Um, there are important references uh, to just transition uh, in the international processes, of course, the uh, preamble of the Paris Agreement, uh, but also the 2015 ILO um, just transition guidelines. As Elisenda was saying, uh, 2023 is an important year for just transition in international in the international arena. Uh, in June, uh, the International Labour Conference had a, a dedicated discussion on just transition, and the outcome reaffirmed the imperative and the urgency of uh, uh, just transition. It endorsed the ILO guidelines as a central reference for as the central reference for policy making. And here you affirm the, uh, the leadership role of the ILO in, the, uh, in multilateral processes when it, when it comes to, to just transition. Um, but that's not the end of 2023 because uh, we will have uh, the COP coming up and we will come to COP uh, uh, in just a moment. Um, but just to spend uh, a bit more on, on the relevance of the ILO guidelines and why we, we, we often uh, present them and use them uh, as a, 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 and, and we use them as our main uh, basis for action and this is that they are being taken up as the, the central reference by any other, many other organizations. Um, the, the guidelines uh, uh, present uh, uh, several guiding principles for a just transition and several uh, uh, policy entry points. Uh, they cut across uh, uh, macro and sectoral policy. They go into employment policy in, re in relation to enterprises, skills and active labor market policies. And then they go into uh, employment uh, um, and uh, social protection and labor protection um, as the key pillars of, of a just transition. Uh, gender is uh, considered uh, cross-cutting issues. Obviously, the, the notion of uh, inclusivity and equity is at the heart of the concept of just transition, so there's no surprise there. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the role of uh, inclusivity is also uh, very explicit in the fact that uh, social dialogue uh, uh, processes, which involve workers and employers, and uh, uh, other stakeholder engagement processes are really um, at, the, at the heart of just transition uh, policy making and implementation. Now, there are also a very important point to consider the process and not just, uh, let's say, the outcome, because uh, um, having a, a social dialogue and stakeholder engagement is really what allows the very bold solutions, the very bold changes the world needs to embrace on climate change to be uh, to enjoy broad-based supports. We know that if policy measures are top-down and they're fast, uh, there's going to be a pushback. While if you have uh, uh, policy processes where uh, employers, uh, workers, uh, youth, uh, and various stakeholders of civil societies feel uh, um, involved, feel they are, their voices are being heard, it's much more likely they are going to support bold and rapid uh, uh, changes. Uh, there's a few entry points uh, um, that uh, we can highlight and that are particularly relevant and provide important uh, uh, angles for uh, the concerns of youth in rural areas uh, in the context of just transition. Um, for us, uh, the, uh, given the very localized uh, impacts, it's important to start with assessments and here uh, making sure that uh, uh, employment and social assessments of climate change and climate policies include uh, the impact, the specific impacts on youth and in rural areas is obviously a very uh, important basis for policy making. 
social dialogue and stakeholder engagement. And here the, it's key that uh, youth are part of those processes. Uh, in, when it comes to public employment process, programs as a, an, as, an, a, um, an important mechanism to generate green jobs and to, um, to support uh, uh, climate and employment goals, we have green works that are uh, pu uh, public works that uh, um, promote climate uh, mitigation or adaptation roles and, and ecosystem restoration while generating uh, employment and providing also entry points for skills development. And on skills development, I think here we are you are going to hear a lot more uh, later on, especially on the um, uh, on on the various initiatives on on jobs on green jobs for youth and, and skills. Now, let me conclude uh, with uh, uh, looking ahead at COP28. Uh, there's a uh, it's just transition is uh, is an important um, element of the various uh, um, tracks uh, that are going to be discussed. The just transition work program is going to be discussed in Dubai, uh, but there's also going to be a goal on adaptation. There's obviously the finance track, and there's a lot of discussions around finance and uh, around uh, loss and damage. A few important uh, aspects to watch out uh, um, is. Uh, the um, the fact that uh, uh, it's increasingly relevant to have a shared understanding of a just transition to make sure that we do have uh, um, meaningful uh, and coherent impacts and this also helps the credibility of efforts and here are the guidelines that have been endorsed by by 187 member states that includes not just government but social partners is really key um, it's really important to keep a focus and attention on cross-country uh, experience sharing and capacity development because a lot is happening and not yet enough is shared. Um, the just transition needs to go beyond energy and I think that's something probably that is quite close to the hearts of people in the rural development community. There has been a lot of talk of energy but what about food system, what about agriculture, uh, what are the impacts of moving to sustainability there? Um, and then obviously the whole question of finance, how can we align uh, financial instruments and financial flows more closely to the objectives of a just transition? So that was a quick run through. I hope that uh, uh, several of those points can be picked up in conversation, but uh, I'll uh, hand it back uh, over to you, Elisenda. Thanks a lot, Camila. I know how busy you are, so I appreciate honestly taking that time to share with us uh, this overview about, you know, key concepts, but also reminding us the level of ambition we need to have at this moment of time and key aspects and entry points and for us to bring forward. And with that in mind, we pass now to the next speakers. Um, we have gathered uh, three speakers that will share with us more concrete examples. So bearing in mind what uh, Camila has shared with us, we will have now uh, three colleagues that will share more on how we can advance uh, towards a just transition um, working and engaging uh, rural youth. So each of them will have a short time to share. And again, I encourage you to share your questions, but also I've seen uh, somebody shared about a survey they, do, they did. So work that you are also doing, it's, it's a moment also to share and cross fertilize us. As Camila was saying, there's a lot going on and we can build a lot on that knowledge. So with that, no more to you, I would give the floor to my colleague Sergio Iriarte Quezada. Um, he works at the ILO as Youth Employment Officer, and he's joining us, so thanks a lot, uh, to share about the Green Jobs uh, for Youth Pact that was launched in the last COP. And I hope that it can give us also uh, some perspective on how um, we are taking action to close the green skills gap and to promote green jobs in, in countries. So with no more to Sergio, we are all ears. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and thank you again, Elisenda and colleagues, for, for inviting me. I think that it's important, this topic, and it's really a pleasure to be with you today. So I'm Sergio, as, as Elisenda mentioned, I work in the Youth Accelerator team of the ILO, and we support youth employment, and we lead the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth, that it's a broader partnership. So maybe to start with just a reminder, I'm, I'm sure that you know the, the ILO and what the ILO is. You heard from Camila, but just as a quick reminder, the ILO is the oldest UN specialized agency. So we were founded in 1919 
and we focus especially on the world of work in broader terms. And ILO is the only tripartite agency of the UN system, as, as you might know. And that means that we don't work only with governments, but also with employers and workers organizations, what makes the beauty of uh, our work as well. So today I will give you an introduction to the Green Jobs for Youth Pact. So I am not going to go into the details and how this can really create a big impact, but I will really talk about the pact itself. I think that it's worth giving an introduction and explaining what it is and, and what it's meant to, to do. So before that, let me start with just one number to keep in mind. So 8.4 million jobs for youth. that that's a, an interesting number to start with. So what I want to mention about that is for really a long time, the people that I mentioned of this environmental and climate change has uh, has been completely for, forgotten. And I think that with, uh, with the Just Transition Agenda that we also heard from Camila, we finally gain a bit of momentum. And this is something that happened really strongly last year, particularly. And the rationale for this is very clear. So in one hand, we have 1.2 billion jobs globally that depend on a healthy and natural environment, something that is really huge. On the other hand, we have millions of jobs that can be created in the green and the blue economies, boosting communities and local economies. That's also something to keep in mind. And ILO's recent estimates show that if policy measures to facilitate a green transition are taken, we can witness the creation of, and it comes the number back, 8.4 million jobs for young people by 2030. So if we do the right things from now, we might be able to create a really large number of jobs for young people specifically. So what is mentioned, important and worth to mention is that clever hands and practical brains will be the most important natural resource in the green transition. Let me move ahead. So in 2021, the ILO, UNICEF and UNEP, so the three agencies, joined forces to, the, to design a special initiative on green jobs for youth. And we did so recognizing the joint work through the UN Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth that I mentioned at the beginning, and the UN Climate Action for Jobs Initiative that both are led by, by the ILO, the UNICEF's Generation Unlimited, and the UNEP's Global Opportunities for Sustainable Development Goals. The pact uh, then brings together our comparative and competitive advantages, and I think that that's also what bring us very strongly in, in on the ground uh, to mobilize the political will, the resources, the innovation, to accelerate global commitments for climate action, secure decent green jobs for youth, that it's the main objective, and foster skills for the green economy. So the, ambitious of, uh, the, the ambition that the pact has is quite big. So I think that you will be hearing that very attentively. So we have three big ambitions. So the first one is creating one million new green jobs with existing employers. The second one is greening one million existing jobs. And the last one is supporting 10,000 young entrepreneurs establishing sustainable green businesses. And all this by 2030, of course. And the idea is that working hand in hand with young people, because also that's very important to work with them, with governments, staff, leaders, social partners, and the private sector and educators, we believe that this can be done by 2030. So we still have seven years to go. So we really believe that this is something feasible. Then something that is quite important as well is to mention that the pact wants to put the intentions into practice. And that's why it was decided not only to work for, but mainly with the young people. So empowering, empowering youth and creating youth engagement passes through a direct collaboration with them, of course. So, and for this reason, a youth advisory board bringing young representatives from different fronts makes a central part of the pact, naturally. 
and in that allows giving the voice directly to those concerned, young women and men. So the pact evolves around three green E's. So the first one is employment creation. So in both wage and self-employment, and especially with a focus on jobs and business models that reduce waste, pollution, and resource use. The second E is the environmental education and skills for green jobs. So the idea is to have formal and informal education, including technical vocational education and training to equip young people with the skills for green jobs. And this too, particularly is what we believe it's, it's, it's crucial to match the demand and supply side, not only to be thinking about creating jobs, but also giving the opportunity to young people to have the skills that are needed in the labor market. And the last E is the empowerment and youth engagement. So youth are partners and supported to, to lead policy advocacy and the social dimension of the triple planetary crisis, meaning climate, biodiversity, loss and pollution. Then uh, we will be uh, pre present, present uh, and leverage our message at COP28. So uh, it was mentioned as well by Camila. So the ILO is really pushing the agenda and we are really bringing everything that we can to contribute to it. And uh, we will be present at the Just Transition Pavilion if in case uh, several of you will be present there. So the idea is that we want to, to secure youth voice, representation and meaningful engagement through a youth advisory body. So what I mentioned uh, earlier, linked to the Climate Action for Jobs Initiative mainly. Then also to take stock and align with existing efforts on green jobs among public, private and youth partners to maximize impact for young people. And finally, to co-create joint initi initiatives, programs and partnerships on youth employment in the green economy, forging a blueprint at country level. And that's uh, quite crucial because we really want to, to have an impact at, at that level. And for that, we have five points that I will walk you through very quick because I'm conscious of time as well, Alessandra, and, and just don't hesitate to raise the hand when, when, if I'm speaking too, too long. But the first one is about the decent jobs for youth in the green economy. So employers support green, blue, circular and sustainable business models that reduce waste pollution, resource use, as I mentioned as well earlier, while increasing the demand for skills for green jobs. Then maybe I will go a bit quicker with the, with the other ones. So you see that we have an environment education skills. So those are part of the three E's. We have the empower, empowerment again, and by doing, by working on focusing on those three, we have this capacity development of governments, social partners and private sector partners. The pact partners will work with policy makers and practitioners enhancing skills and capabilities for green job creation. And lastly, the evidence-based advocacy that is also very important that the pact will contribute to closing the data and, and evidence gap about uh, what works in boosting green jobs for youth and sharing knowledge through the youth foresight knowledge platform mainly. Then um, I'm, I'm coming to the end. So the commitments are really not binding, binding, and the pact looks for quality partners rather than than having a large number. So what we want is really partners that are fully committed to the ambitious uh, objectives, rather than focusing on large partnerships as as normally we we have in other in other initiatives. So the commitments uh, can go from in kind to financial commitments. For example, the partners might be already doing a lot of achievement, uh, achieving the impact goals, such as creating jobs in the green economy or, or greening existing jobs. So initiatives that they are already maybe taking care of. And those partners might be willing to develop joint initiatives with, with uh, all, all us, so meaning the ILO, UNEP, UNICEF and the others and uh, to co, -de co develop partnerships to have a strong collaboration among members. Finally, the promotion of the pact is crucial for visibility, of course, and making the network grow. So you might be already contributing to the pact without noticing it. Let's join forces and create impact 
by being part of the change. I think that that's the, the main message that I will give you today. And we only have one planet and we are young only once in our lives. So I think that that's the, the, the link to be made. Thank you very much. And we look really forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Alison and everybody. Thanks a lot, Sergio, for sharing so much about the Green Jobs for Youth Pact and your inspiring words as well. Um, I think colleagues have shared a little bit more in the chat box, so thanks a lot. And I would pass now the floor to our colleague, uh, Sein Young Lee from the FAO, where she works precisely uh, in a project in promoting green jobs for rural youth employment. And she will share briefly um, about their experience and their perspective uh, into that. So thanks a lot for joining us today and we are all ears. Thank you, Alessandra, and good morning, um, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Camila and Sergio, for opening the webinar with very insightful presentation. Um, Sergio, the, the number 8.4 million just is still uh, stuck in my mind, so thanks for um, mentioning that important number. Uh, my name is Hong Yang Lee. I'm a green job specialist at Distant Rural Employment Team here at Food and Agriculture Organization of the UNFAO at the HQ. Um, I'm very glad to share some lessons learned of FAO's work on green jobs for rural youth employment, particularly um, uh, the experiences that we got um, from the ongoing project and also to present FAU's um, approach on green jobs for rural youth and finally linking them with that important COP28 discourse. So without further ado, let me get started. Um, so let's begin with the, the fundamental question of um, why do green jobs um, in agri-food sector matter for rural youth? I believe um, Camila and Sergio already answered perfectly to this question in the earlier um, presentations. Um, over 87% of global youth population resides in developing countries and many of them relying on agriculture for their livelihoods. Meanwhile, the agri-food sector contributes 30% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions the linkage between the jobs for rural youth and climate change is very crystal clear. Without support for the rural youth to get access to employment opportunity, effective climate action becomes very, very difficult. Um, today, we'll explore how FAA is actively addressing this critical nexus, sharing some good practice and positive cases and very practical cases that we observed. So um, FAO's approach to green jobs for rural youth centers on having the youth lead in creating green jobs, which starts with um, problem identification and solving. In the initial stage of our green jobs um, project, youth are um, provided with soft skills training, including a module, a dedicated module for problem solving identification um, and, and solve problem solving. The problems, um, including environmental challenges of their own communities, are to be solved uh, with the solutions that the youth found out uh, during this course. Then the youth can make a choice between two options, either starting their own business, green, green startups, or participating in our wage employment program, or sometimes it could be public employment program as well. Um, in this way, uh, youth indeed take the lead role in creating green jobs for themselves. And our second main approach is sustainable and continuous support for this youth-led initiatives. After these youth choose one of these two options, green startups or wage employment program, FAU provides still continuous support over two years to ensure higher sustainability of these green startups and wage employment initiatives. For those youth who are for starting green startups, they receive mentorship and seed money support. On the other hand, um, those participants in the 
wage employment program undergo um, sector specific training, um, such as black sort of fly layering or behaving practices and receive a monthly wages and also benefit from a social protection scheme. They, we want to um, share now a concrete example of one of our green entrepreneurs. Therefore, um, this um, green entrepreneur choose a green startup option um, in Zimbabwe. So, Courage Grandma, um, who is our one of our youth in Zimbabwe, identified um, environmental issues during the soft skills training, such as land degradation due to chemical fertilizer overuse, lack of electricity, being in very far rural area, and plastic pollution. So after that, he decided to start his own um, organic egg production business. He is um, right now running his agribusiness using poultry manure for crop cultivation solar energy for lightning and heating, and um, he minimizes plastic uses. This green, pra green practices enabled him and his team to produce the eggs at the low cost, making the eggs affordable and viable protein source for the community, therefore making their business economically viable. And furthermore, this success empowered Courage and his team to take the role of uh, um, role as a leader of green entrepreneur in his community, influencing um, his community members. Um, we observe that when the youth are fully and truly empowered, they become really ready and very committed to take climate actions and even to lead the other people, other community members, family and friends to join this um, climate actions and eventually um, um, help their community to a just transition because they want to spread this impact, they want to share this impact with the others. Um, as reconfirmed by Camilla um, earlier, as um, these initiatives are truly bottom up and initiative uh, initiated by the youth, I believe. Um, therefore, in this way, they could make their voice heard at a large scale, maybe starting from their community and then district level, and finally at the national level, um, and hopefully. Uh, activities, national such as national determined contributions or national adaptation plan. Um, finally, we empathize supporting rural youth with green jobs through empowering them so that they engage in and even lead um, these national climate actions by doing their, their work, their jobs. Um, in conclusion, the journey we've embarked on together today reflects FAS commitment to empowering rural youth through creating green jobs with and for, for them. Um, as we anticipate COP28, let's ensure our collective efforts amplify the voices and impact of um, our future leaders, um, including us, I believe, from heart, um, our rural youth. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jung, for sharing with us your experience. And with that, with that call to put rural youth at the center, I give the floor to our last speaker of today, that Gerald Casita, who's joining us from Uganda. He is a youth champion from the White Bar Network, and I hope you can share with us a little bit about your experience, but also to give us some advice, uh, your perspective on how we can advance based on what you've heard also today. You have uh, seven minutes more or less, so maybe we can have some questions and answers at the end. So welcome, Gerald. Thank you very much, um, Gerard Casita, uh, White Pad, uh, uh, District Ambassador, and I'm also the CEO and founder of Vibrant Generation Uganda Youth Empowerment Center. It's uh, a rural uh, NGO in uh, Uganda uh, that champions sustainable livelihood and self confidence among the rural youth. Um, as uh, on behalf of White Pad, uh, we've really uh, also done a lot uh, towards uh, ensuring that 
uh, we are uh, uh, embracing the green jobs. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the previous speakers, I've been so much uh, uh, noted something that uh, a joint transition is not possible without the youth. So that means uh, as we are transiting uh, to a greener, a greener future, we have to involve the youth at each and every, every step. Uh, as WIPAD, uh, we've been able to, uh, to, to organize uh, webinars, uh, one uh, on uh, youth opportunities, uh, on climate change, and then also uh, uh, a, a webinar on uh, food loss and food waste. And still, uh, uh, among this, uh, one of, we have one of uh, a, a youth champion, uh, Okelo Steven, who came up and, uh, with uh, an initiative from one of these uh, webinars, uh, and he's, he led uh, the tree planting campaign. And this has become a serious and has got him recognized as a nomination. Uh, in the Green Finance uh, Awards 20. So we've been able to see that this youth, uh, we do empower. We've been also worked with uh, in partnership with Rossi Dogan College and Avis, and we've trained uh, 15 uh, YPAD members in value addition, uh, creating out more opportunities of how these youth can really engage. And as well, uh, what we've been uh, also have been able to do, we've been able to uh, participate in uh, the food system uh, transfor transformation discussion with other civil society organizations. As you know that the food system exceeds diversity, and that means a people-centric approach is so essential. So that means it falls upon us as civil society organization to ensure that food systems, they embody sustainability and inclusivity as we strive for world free from hunger. And you know, uh, we've been uh, also uh, the YPAD network, we've joined other 13 youth-led organizations uh, into the food system partnership. This uh, food system partnership, uh, it's, uh, it's a combination of uh, different uh, collective endeavor organizations uh, which have come together to address the global food system crisis. And as YPAD, we've been part of that. And we realized that us being just coming as one youth, uh, youth perspective, it isn't enough to galvanize action on food systems. So we had to navigate and partner out with other uh, youth-led organizations in the sector because this complex channel of food system transformation, it needs uh, a range of experience, knowledge, and cultural context. That's why we're excited to partner with all these other, uh, other organizations in the food system partnership. And as well, also, uh, we've been able to engage uh, with Vibrant Generation Uganda. We've, had, we've been having uh, a, a, an engagement on reimagining uh, a, a healthy food system through agroecology, youth taking lead. When we are looking at the integral role of a youth in shaping a more sustainable and equitable food system. And we've also engaged in policy dialogues and uh, together with other sports art organizations to and, uh, developed a position to the government of Uganda to ensure that on to ensure on issues of climate issues where our emphasis was uh, considering and adopting agroecology as a strategic intervention and a pathway for enhancing climate resilience, sustainable food production and food security. And as well uh, as white part, uh, we've been able uh, to engage still with uh, the Global Forum for Agriculture Advisory Services uh, which is going to be implementing a project with us uh, in uh, Africa and Latin America. And in Africa, we're only going to implement this project with two countries, Madagascar and Uganda, and as well as also in Latin America, that is uh, Eukada, e Eukada and uh, Costa, Rica, Costa, Rica, Costa Rica. So all these are going to be uh, platforms, ways of how we can engage our youth in the different uh, 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 entities. And as well, also, uh, we, we are having uh, a, still a project uh, which is led uh, by one of our country representatives, uh, Daniel Chiseka, uh, on, uh, together with the Uganda National Metropolitan Me Metrological Authority, UNIMA, where we are going to look at uh, a community-led adaptation solution for sustainable and resilient development under a changing climate and environment. And environment. Here we are going to see that we are going to create access weather information as an early warning uh, against harsh climate, all shocks, 
and then also we are going to ensure that we are empowering 20,000 uh, farmers through this uh, pilot program, which is starting uh, early next year in February, so that we can see, be able to we engage all the district ambassadors, because as YPAD in Uganda here, we are trying to, we have uh, come up with uh, a way of engaging a different uh, youth across the country through the ambassadors. So each district, we have got their one uh, YPAD ambassador to reach out, to help out, to mobilize other youth. And also, uh, in uh, uh, as we are organizing for the uh, the COP28, uh, we uh, urge that uh, priority uh, we should uh, prioritize Africa's adaptation needs on the COP28 agenda, especially on agriculture, food systems, agroecology, smallholder farmer support to build resilience, because this should include protection of land rights, rangelands, protection of indigenous communities, and as well as also involving these, these youth from the word go, from the processes, all the processes, not just having them on a panel, but engaging them so that together we can be able to see that uh, we have got uh, a sustainable solutions and a greener future. And to sum it up all, I could say, I could conclude by saying that this journey needs a uh, collaboration and well-coordinated efforts knowledge sharing and collective commitment to in order to promote an equitable and inclusive and sustainable development thank you very much thanks a lot Gerald, for these uh, powerful words that remind us um not only how active but how proactive uh, rural youth are um, in finding solutions uh, to concrete problems. So I think here we are all uh, with you when you say that it's not only about having a young person sitting in a panel, but also to engage uh, young people in the follow-up, so in the processes, in how we translate conclusions into concrete actions. So um, thanks a lot for joining us uh, today. I think we have completed our um, speakers for today. I've seen us quite some action in the chat. Um, we have a few minutes, not much, uh, for some questions. Um, I think there were some discussions around the concept of just transition. I don't know if they've been clarified or maybe Camila wants to add further to it. Um, I think there were some people that were maybe asking a bit more of clarifications about that. Um, and then I think there were some questions in the chat about some fears on the FAO project. So maybe I leave the floor to Camila to briefly if she if she wants to complement and then to see Jung to complement maybe her answer in the chat. Thanks. No, and big thanks to um, Syriac, I think, on the points on, uh, because of course it is a, an important point that is raised both at national and international level, how much is the just transition a straight jacket and uh, can there be a just uh, one just transition and uh, why not many and um, how does it fit uh, uh, with the specific context that different countries and different groups uh, face. Um, now, that's an important point indeed because uh, uh, of course, as we've seen uh, earlier and in in, the, in in many presentations, um, what uh, uh, the, the challenge is that uh, each uh, uh, group of youth, uh, each rural area face, uh, each country face are different when it comes to the shift to sustainability and to climate change, and therefore the the the, um, uh, the responses need to be context. Specific. Uh, they need to be driven by granular assessments of what uh, labor market and the implications for youth of the transitions are and uh, uh, solutions that are driven uh, by national stakeholders. At the same time, uh, this does not mean that we cannot have a uh, shared understanding because if we don't have shared understanding, then anything goes and that's very dangerous so we could label just transition something for instance that uh, is not participatory and it's top down you could uh, impose uh, a, a project or a large scale programs that hires youth 
um, in green sectors with no youth participations and no participations from workers or no participation from enterprises. Um, if we don't, uh, that could be counted as just transition if we don't have a, a common understanding. Uh, so I think it is important to, to cluster and mobilize and rally around uh, um, a common understanding that uh, uh, guides us in terms of uh, overarching principles and that recognizes that, of course, the specifics have to be context specific and, uh, and, uh, and country driven. So, and the, the, the ILO guidelines with this uh, very broad endorsement, uh, I think, provide uh, uh, the, the right platform to exactly do that. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Camila. Maybe you say, say you, when you want to add on on the wage employment question you had? Um, thank you. Thank you, Alessandra and Camila for the answer. Um, I think the question is on the share um, between the green entrepreneurship and the wage employment project uh, program. Sorry. Um, so I, I answered as I answered on the chat, uh, the ratio, at least within the current um, ongoing project is uh, around 50 to 50. So half of our youth engaged in the green entrepreneurship track and uh, the wage employment program. Of course, there was some lessons learned. Initially, youth are more, let's say, tend to um, be in flavor of um, going for the green entrepreneurship track. So starting their own business because um, they needed some more information on what is this wage employment program. So in that way, we support it uh, with them to have them understand what it really means and what they, are, what they can expect, uh, including the social protection scheme and the monthly wages and sector specific training and etc. so that they understand what is distant job which should be for the green jobs as well. Um, so yeah, and I also wanted to mention that the, the let's say um, our project is still a pilot stage. So um, in terms of the number of beneficiaries, it's not, not that large scale. It's around um, 600 to 700 in, uh, in three countries. However, we did observe a lot of impacts, including direct and indirect impacts of this 700 youth can make in their community which is more than double. So um, I wanted to just empathize that that fact that given the rural settings and uh, being in the agriculture sector, um, the impacts that we can actually measure or sometimes we cannot even measure is, is really huge. Um, this is something that we have been observing. Thank you so much again. Thanks a lot. I think um, it's been very, very important uh, relevant that question actually because we often uh, uh, there's a tendency to think that uh, youth employment is mainly on the entrepreneurial side but there is a wealth of potential to promote uh, wage employment and there are a lot of considerations to make there in order to make sure that wage employment is also decent work so thanks a lot for sharing that experience with us i think we have time to close uh, we've been very good with timing so thanks a lot for, to everybody Body. <laughs> it was a challenge because we had a lot of ground to cover. I hope you found um, the experience that have been shared, the concepts that have been reminded us, inspiring and uh, might guide us um, as we head uh, towards the COP28. But I will leave uh, the floor to my colleague Frank. Maybe he wants to add a couple of words on behalf of the technical working group. So thanks from my behalf. Thanks a lot to everybody. Yeah, thank you, Alessandra. Thanks, everyone. And very sorry for being late at the beginning. I had some connection issues, but I think I then managed and uh, understood most of the inputs. And I think they have been very inspiring and also complementary. So to see the, uh, the overall framework, the numbers, the relevance, but also concrete examples on how this can be done. Um, I think this is really great. But I also think uh, we see that the two agendas of just transition and agri-food system transformation, they are still somehow apart. We also heard there is a just transition pavilion. We also have a food system pavilion. I at least hope they are next to each other. So there is a chance also to talk to each other at the COP because I think this is really crucial not to better link these two agendas. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to the COP now. And hopefully this will be a milestone in this direction. Uh, and yeah, I think we are very much looking forward at the Global Donor Platform to engage further with you on the topic and also thanks to the Secretariat for organizing this webinar. 
And yeah, very much looking forward to Five Engage. Hello, happy COP28 to everybody. Good work. And I hope we will have the occasion to meet soon to discuss more of these issues. And with that, we close the seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.